Um, our topic today of today's episode will be the crisis as magnifier glass. So all about the question what we learn about uh, or, or what the crisis helps us to learn or what we need to learn. And before we start the discussion, I would like uh, everybody of you to give a short introduction of who you are. Um, and yeah, somehow, as, as we link it to, to our portal4.org, um, um, what, what, what is your motivation or what is special about, for, for you about the Portal 4 story? Um, Rebecca, would you like to start? My name is Rebecca Wilkinson. Good morning to you all, or whatever time of day it is. And uh, I am an art therapist. That's, you know, I would say that's my primary identity. But secondary uh, is my interest in work around dehumanizing and rehumanizing, reconnecting with others. And so I think art in particular is a way to do that. It's a way to get a glimpse of others. Uh, and just briefly, the, the way I got to this work was um, through inpatient psychiatric care and just working uh, with frontline providers. And so I think of what's going on in our country at this um, moment, the United States, as uh, again being police officers, frontline providers, um, and what separates them from others and how to reconnect them. Uh, and so uh, this has racial implications. It has all sorts of implications. And so that's the connection with you here today is around how the arts can help people to reconnect and rehumanize. Thank you very much. Then I'll go around like I see it in the gallery view. Um, then Daryl, please. My name is Daryl Davis. I'm here in the United States in the Washington DC area. Um, music is my profession, but studying race relations has been my obsession for about 35 years. And in between gigs, I wrote a book on the uh, Ku Klux Klan. I'm working on my second book now, and there's been a uh, documentary done on my work. But as a band leader, my job is to bring harmony between all the voices on stage, whether they are vocal voices or instrumental voices. The only time you want dissonance in music is when you intentionally interject it into, into the composition or the song. Because if it happens randomly, it's no longer music, it's noise. Somebody hit a bad note or, or played out a tune or something like that. So it's my job to bring my band in harmony. And <clears throat> when I step off the stage, it's natural for me to want harmony amongst my, my fellow citizens or anybody you know that I, have to pass through in, in society. So I try to use music as a, as a bridge to bring in people together. And in doing so, I've done extensive work with, uh, with white supremacists, uh, mainly uh, Ku Klux Klan members, some neo-Nazis, and some members of the, of the new uh, alt-right, if you will. They're the latest uh, incarnation, if you will. And uh, that, that keeps me pretty busy because this country is wrought uh, with them. But I feel though that we are turning a page and I'm very happy to say that and be a part of that, uh, of that process. Thank you so much. And Arno, the next. My name is uh, Arno Michaelis. I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the United States. I am a storyteller and my storytelling has a lot of vectors. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a public speaker. And I'm an author. I've uh, published two books. My first book's called My Life After Hate. The latest one is co-authored with a brilliant man named Pardeep Singh Kalika and a brilliant woman named Robin Gabby Fisher. That book's called The Gift of Our Wounds. I'm also an educator, a consultant, and a fake it till you make it filmmaker. And all of my storytelling is really done with the intention to, to connect human beings and, and to inspire us to see ourselves in one another and see others within ourselves. And I think once that spiritual connection is made, we are then in a position to address political issues. And so that's the, the focus of my work I've been doing for the past 10 years. And all of my work is informed and driven by my past as a very violent white nationalist from 1987 to 1994. Thank you very much. Ian. 
I'm Ian. I'm not in America. I'm in Plymouth in the UK. Um, and I, I, I'm a teacher and a teacher trainer. I, I work with educators and young people. And the work that I do is around dialogue. I think a lot of people just assume dialogue is one of those things that it's easy for people to do. Uh, and, and then they find that it isn't quite as easy as they thought it was. And the work that I do is very much focused around giving people practical tools to be able to do dialogue effectively so that young people particularly, but also their teachers, can encounter one another, can meet difference and um, speak their own truth and have it heard and to give young people a voice that can be heard quite literally sometimes around the world, which is, which is a great privilege and a great honor. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I will also give a short introduction of, of me. Um, I'm Markus Fahrt. I'm also not in the US, but in Europe, in, in Germany, close to Munich. Um, I have done for about, I think, 20 years now, almost 20 years, violence and conflict research and have developed an, a holistic overarching theory on violence and nonviolence. And um, through all this work I've been doing, I've been working as counselor, as, as mediator. Um, I came to the conclusion that the best way to reach out really to, to get, yeah, to reach out to as many people as possible and touch them on an important part of their being is art. And so and I, I was uh, convinced after a long period of science that you have to combine science and art. So, and, and this was somehow um, what, what brought me in contact with Daryl and so Daryl what brought me in contact um, with this group, which uh, was really one of the greatest gifts I, I received in my life. So, so thank you all for that and thank you for being here. Um, and for the introduction, let's start with uh, with the first statement. I would also do a short statement round. You don't have to limit it to just one sentence, but but to uh, to, to one uh, yeah really a strong phrase or, or statement. What you will remember when somehow somewhere this crisis will be over, and I'm explicitly not uh, calling it a COVID crisis because. I think everywhere around the world, the crisis somehow was starting with COVID or COVID uh, yeah, somehow intensified crisis, a crisis that already existed and other crises joined it. So I'm, uh, it's, it's really uh, total, uh, total intentional that I'm just calling it the crisis. Um, so please tell me, when it will be over, um, what will you remember about this crisis? Um, Ian, would you like to start this round? I think for me, I don't think it's going to be over. I think, I think that's one of the things that's, that's tricky. And I think that the, the real crisis is the existential crisis is climate change. And, and we haven't got to grips with that. And I kind of feel that having been someone involved in climate activism for quite a long time, it's really frustrating that everybody, every government in the world kind of goes, no, 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 that's, that's not important. Well, have we got time to deal with that? It's not a big deal. And then something comes along like COVID and all of a sudden, wham, all bets are off. Uh, you know, lots and lots of people are, lots and lots of governments are doing lots of fantastic things. All the planes stop, all the ships stop. The whole world grinds to a halt from a disease. And, and you know, the, there is this huge desire to go back to normal. Well, there won't, there won't be a normal, you know, there was, there was some of the stuff that's coming out recently around, you know, climate tipping points, you know, four of the big six are practically there. And, and we're looking at a stage where the, we are looking at runaway heating and, and, and the, the planet changing and, and the kind of existential threat that is much, much larger than, than what we are addressing now. I mean, now having said that, of course, I think... I think it's been a very crazy time for everyone. I think, I think one of the things I would definitely say that I'll look back on is the fact that it's, it kind of, it makes people get off the fence. It shows you who they really are. They're either really nice people or they're the other thing. Um, but but in, a, in a situation, in a crisis, it kind of makes people who would normally spend their time plotting a subtle course right down the middle of everything and not giving everything away. They can't do that now. So I think for me, the takeaway is that 
moments like this really show you what people are made of. Thank you. Um, Arno, would you like to continue? I really uh, appreciate what Ian had to say about the climate crisis. A, a lot of my storytelling and my speaking is uh, based upon the idea of like, we, we're, we are all, all human beings on this planet, on this spaceship that we all occupy together and we all depend on the same life support systems. Uh, this, our, our life support systems are in crisis. And so we need to get our stuff together uh, on these political issues, these social issues that are stopping us from coming together as a society and addressing what I feel is, is the most pressing issue. And I agree entirely with Ian in that regard that um, climate change is the, the most, the biggest issue that humanity faces. And it's something we're being uh, distracted from once again uh, by the COVID pandemic uh, once again, by race relations, once again, by uh, economic issues, political issues. So uh, I, I think we need to have a new urgency to address those things that are distracting us because we got some, some real work to do. Uh, I, I think the pandemic followed by the, uh, I'd say, a, 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 a systemic crisis that the, the United States is, is in the midst of right now that the entire world is, uh, I, it, it's, it's uplifting to see uh, people around the world uh, speaking out in solidarity for uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. And I, I think Black Lives Matter is a very important thing to say. Uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm also very wary of it uh, becoming yet another piece of dogma that's, that's stopping us from making the, the connection we need to make. And uh, I, I, I think one thing I'll certainly remember about this period is uh, how quickly people bond, uh, for better or worse. I, I, I'm working on another similar project to ours that and I had a, a, with a, a people in Bangkok and Australia and I had a call with them on, on Friday night and uh, this brilliant artist that I'm working with, Alina Gosina, said uh, people bond, like they're going to bond one way or another. And if, if uh, they, they can bond over a hatred of police, they can bond over a passion to uh, see justice. They can bond over, uh, a denial <laughs> of, of problems and so they just how eat the the it's it's a very really, it's a it's a i'd say a delicious irony if it wasn't so threatening <laughs> but we, we can bond for good or evil or, or anything in between very very easily and, and it's uh it's a big challenge to direct that bonding in a healthy healthy way that's gonna uh, get us to a point where we can address this larger looming crisis of climate in, in the process of addressing all these other issues. Yeah, thank you. We will definitely come, come back to some of these points. So um, especially about what we can do uh, to, to help that, that somehow it goes into a positive or better direction. Um, let's just let's just finish uh, the the remembrance round and then we go into the open discussion. Uh, Rebecca, what will you remember? Uh, again, kind of piggybacking on Arno and Ian, I, I I also feel like this has has illuminated things that were were longstanding and um, I, I you know I think a pivotal moment. Um, by my estimation, above and beyond. Well, well, one thing that really struck me was that we could actually stop everything. That really blew my mind, I have to say. That because there's this way that we sort of complacently go along, and, and I, I do it too, with um, the, the things that are contributing to the demise of of you know this planet or the human species um, on it because maybe the planet survives but we don't uh, and and to see everything stop made me realize that it could stop and I had never really believed before that we could simply 
you know, put a break on. And so I, again, you know, naturally people just sort of, uh, you know, resisted this. And, but, but it does tell us that it can happen, which means that the possibility of it happening again, and it, we may be forced to because, of course, the pandemic may, that we have not resolved this. And, and the world has sort of resumed as if, certainly, uh, I live in Arizona, and, and it's like nothing ever happened. I mean, literally, and, and of course, we are now the hot spot in the country. And yet, if you, you know, yesterday I went out and it was like nothing had, had ever occurred. But the, so, so that was one takeaway that we could stop. And then the other thing was when um, in our country, when it became evident that the people that were most adversely being affected were people, you know, of color, so to speak, um, that then, then that systemic issue I, I'm not surprised that we are where we are today because it just began to bubble up that yet again, this the disparities of how uh, we are affected in this country by uh, seemingly inconsequential things or, or seemingly unrelated to something like race, but then you would have it emerge. And, and again, the, the country restarting and how uh, adversely it affects different pockets so I feel like that that is, has some momentum. The police violence is the thing that instigated it in this country, but it was so completely interwoven in the entire uh, pandemic, I guess, impact. And, and so I, I don't think that that has, has been pulled together yet. Uh, it's beginning to be seen that this is, this is not just about police brutality. It's about uh, these systems that have been so pervasively, uh, they, they have cut people from being able to, um, to, to, to really better their lives on, on a generational basis. And so I'm, that is thrilling to me that that may actually be getting some leverage in this country because it feels like it hasn't for the last 40 years. I mean, literally, it's like we've just pretended like everything is good. In fact, it's advancing as if it were actually that we were advancing, which seems absurd to me. And now we, we see evidence. So thank you for letting me share. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Daryl, let us know what you will remember. Well, I will remember a lot of things. Um, I'll remember the half a dozen so far friends that I've lost to COVID. I could not attend their funerals. Um, even some of their own family members could not attend their funerals. So I definitely will remember that. Um, two of them have been musicians, you know, that I've worked with. So you know, they're, they're in my thoughts and in my prayers. Um, but one of the most important things that I will remember uh, for this COVID thing, while while right now it's over 108,000, 109,000 in this country that have died from, uh, from COVID, which is a, a humongous number. And certainly, you know, the death of one or two is tragic, but over 109,000 is just, you, you can't even get your head around it. Uh, but anyway, I think that the COVID crisis is a bittersweet thing. Uh, the better part I've just talked about, the deaths. Uh, and hopefully there will be some kind of cure for it. I agree with Ian that, that the normal as we once knew is not going to return exactly the same way. You know? And that's fine. You know, we, we, we can always grow from, from, uh, from new things. And, and we are a resilient people. And we will make new discoveries and, and adjust our lives accordingly. That's what we do. And that's one reason why black people are still here in this country because we, we, we are resilient, but the whole country is resilient. But what I, what I wanna say is, uh, is a positive um, part of the bittersweet thing of COVID is that this uprising that is going on in this country, the voice of the people is finally starting to get heard. Uh, you know, there've always been white people that have participated in our civil rights uh, protests and demonstrations dating back to 
you know, Martin Luther King and even before. But for the first time in the history of this country, there have been many more people who look like the people that we're trying to get to listen to us who are joining in with our marches and our protests. And now our collective voice is being heard, whereby before the black voice by itself was not being listened to at all. It was being shut down. Now, finally, I believe that we are turning a page in history and, and, and a lot of good will come out of that. Um, because people are gonna listen to people who look like them as well. And the thing of it is, with the COVID thing, there are probably a lot more protesters uh, on the streets because now they have the time to do this because they're not working. You know, they're on lockdown. Uh, you know, their, their states or their counties or their towns have, have not fully reopened. They can't go back to their jobs just yet, et cetera. So they have the time uh, to get out there and do something. And as a result, we're seeing tens of thousands of people, not just spread out across the country, over hundreds of thousands of people across the country, but tens of thousands of people in singular cities coming out and, and standing up for what's right. And this is not something in a vacuum. You know, we've, we've been looking for this for decades, for over a century. And now we're seeing that page turn. I mean, we still have a, have a ways to go before we get to the end of the book, but at least you start by turning the pages. And this is what's happening now. And I'm, I'm very uh, hopeful, uh, probably more hopeful than I've ever been in my life, that, that things are gonna you know, begin to change. Um, the police are beginning to, to see themselves for what we've been telling them for so many uh, decades. And thank goodness for video cameras because we were saying the same things before video and now we have the video. So it's almost undeniable. And like I said, people are not working, they can stay home. They're tuning into their TV sets, they're seeing what's happening. And then you know, they're getting up and going out and participating because now they recognize it and they're saying, like, like we've been saying for years, enough is enough. So that's, you know, that's one of the biggest things that I'm gonna remember this, uh, this historic uh, event. And I think there is a, a shining light at the end of the tunnel, uh, an extra benefit of this uh, COVID-19 thing, you know, that has, that has brought people together in, in this uprising in this country uh, and, and around the world as well. I think that uh, the issue of, uh, of climate change will also see a turn because when people, when people come together and, and, and cooperate and coordinate and they resolve one problem and get over that one hurdle, it's a lot easier for them to come together again and address another issue. The, the issue of, of racism in this country has been my primary focus. Um, and I think, like I said, we're gonna you know, see, see it slowly changing for the better <clears throat> with people who don't look like us you know, joining us in this thing. And when we see that impact, then we turn and we address another issue, like, uh, like, like uh, climate change. And the more people you have working together, as we've proven with this thing, it will also <clears throat> affect the decisions on climate change because we figure, hey, you know what? We made it over this hurdle, let's take over the next one. Thank you, that's a- You're welcome. Point, and I, I also, um, yeah, this is probably the most important thing I am remembering about this crisis. It's a, it's a mix of fear and hope and of, you know, really bad things happening, but also many people getting together, trying to, and, and, and I think what, what I will remember probably most is how many people started to do something to help others within their, their possibilities, you know? Sometimes I, I, I remember people like, um, like here uh, in, in uh, my, my wife and my neighbor, they simply started with sewing machines to produce masks for, for poor people. And this is something I, I remember. And I, I think, yeah, that this is also with like Rebecca, what you said about the systemic thing that I think it 
can be possible that the positive impulses we see on, on how people are creative and working for others on the micro level can also be transferred to a systemic, to a macro level. And this is, I think, something we, we, we can learn about. And yeah, I, I also remember, or I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by um, what most of you uh, talked about, um, that we see so many people bonding together, getting together, and, and that this, it, it seems like, quite natural or easy that people join groups or getting together and for the one thing or the one direction or the other. And this is, I, I would like to uh, use this as a, as a starting point with our group here that, that got together. Um, we heard a lot about, uh, so far, and we've come back to it, like what is happening in the US. And this is where I would like to, to go to Ian uh, on, on the UK. And what are you experiencing there about are people getting also together? Are they joining in groups? Are they bonding? So what is, what is your imp impression um, in the UK about that? I think, and, and it has to be said, you know, we've been in lockdown now for two months or so. So I only know what I see in the media. I mean, certainly what I see in my own community. And I think, yes, people have become much more community-minded and community-spirited. There is a lot more people making an effort to look after one another and to make sure that people are okay. I mean, I think that's something that is, it's not only been highlighted in the media, but it's something that you see in the kind of world around you. Now, I think the challenge is at the moment, we're in this bizarre situation in the UK where kind of, we're still technically locked down, but in our heads, we've already started not to be for various reasons. And I think there's, there's a kind of, bit of dissonance there for a lot of people and it will be interesting to see whether the the bonds that have been created and the community spirit that's been um emphasized is something that will persist into the future i hope it will i hope it will i think many of those relationships are profound and permanent and 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 will will sustain but i think we will probably start talking about them less which is a shame i think the media will start talking about other things it will be back to business as usual um, or at least as, as close as they can get. So I think, yes, I think one of the, one of the things that I just wanted to say before I kind of pass it on is, is for me, one of the big dissonances has been the difference between the way that people work as individuals in the sense that, you know, throughout this whole experience, people have been really good and are trying to be there for one another in many cases and trying to support one another and there is a sense that both with COVID and with the Black Lives Matter movement, there is an enormous upswelling of popular individual support for it. You know, we see demonstrations here in the UK. I think they've been happening pretty much all over the world. We certainly see it being something refer referenced on social media from many, many countries. And that I think is really excellent. The thing I find really quite challenging is the way that our governments have addressed or failed to address COVID. COVID is a global problem and we have not had any global leadership. In fact, <laughs> I think in terms of other things in my lifetime, it has been marked by a stunning lack of global leadership. Nobody has really done it. You know, individual countries have done a good job, but no one has said we should be doing this together. You know, and that, if you look at other things that have happened in the past, whether they've been conflicts or diseases or things like that there has always been a kind of urge towards this is a global problem we should address it globally and yet that's been entirely absent this time and in fact very often the narratives are we are doing better than everybody else our country is the one that is going to come out of this the best or you know whatever or we want the vaccine we want to develop it here and keep it for ourselves and it's just really unpleasant nativistic stuff and that's a shame i think and i think uh, you know, in a way this is kind of the first this will be the first of many challenges that require genuine global leadership and genuine global collaboration and we need leaders who can do that and you see them in the black Lives matter movement and you see them in the way that people are spontaneously working together in different countries around the world on a number of issues i think i think the, the global climate strike school strike Greta Thunberg is an outstanding example of the way that you know youth leadership is something that springs up on a grassroots level all over the world and is able to connect and communicate in a way that governments who have all the abilities and the 
the, the backups there to do it have, have just totally dropped the ball on. So I think it's a, you know, those are the two things I would kind of want to pick up in, in response to the, the bringing together. I think on a local personal level, COVID has, has kind of driven a lot of really powerful stuff. And I hope that the, the stuff we see coming out of the Black Lives Matter responses is something that will, will also move things forward. Because it hasn't all, some of that community building, as other people said, hasn't all been positive. You know, some of the communities that have thrived have not been the ones that we will want to necessarily cherish. Thank you. Enough from me. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to almost pose a question because I, I feel like, you know, I, I, I am, am not an optimist. And so I, I need to, you know, I like hearing more optimistic voices on this panel. Um, I, I think that Ian and I, Ian, sometimes I think of you as being both a, a, an optimist and a pessimist, but um, this, this sort of nativism or um, we call it tribalism here, um, but you know, it, 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 it is definitely like you could say that we are advancing, um, but some people could argue that we're actually uh, yeah. regressing. So you have countries like Brazil, the United States, I mean, the United States is becoming a quintessential example of, of tribalistic responses to, to a global crisis. I mean, that's shocking to many people. And many people are still in denial about that and still believe that America is being a leader when in fact the opposite is true. And, uh, and we're, we're setting an example um, of the very thing that, uh, that counters what what we're talking about here. So, so, you know, I sort of pose a question um, about what direction, because although you could say that there are these movements that are bubbling up or this response that is more communal, uh, there's also a, a, this splintering of factions. And, and yet, I, I would say optimistically that I, I truly believe that, that this, um, the Black Lives Matter the way that it is actually speaking to more than just race is something that is bubbling up in the world. Like this cause, I think, is taking on so much steam because it is about people who are being oppressed, literally not being able to survive um, a as a result of, of, of systems that are keeping, that are, are, are perpetuated and even um, supported. So, so I'd sort of pose that question, but I also want to say something that, um, that I've really taken away from Arno uh, from the get-go that we have uh, met, and I don't think that Arno is the only person who holds this, because Daryl and Marcus, you are all collaborating, and that is service. And one of the things that we as a group had started to develop was this idea of educating people um, and, and, and the idea that it's really about getting people at the start. And I was having a conversation with a, a cousin of mine who is a, a college professor here at the University of Arizona. And we were talking about how educational systems have, have been interrupted right now. And I thought of Arno actually, and I thought about that idea that the whole educational system is so broken that we are, that and and the the thing that would I believe that would fix it would be service. That instead of service being something that is an, an incidental thing that you step into another community and you get to mingle with, you know, these others, um, like the Peace Corps. I mean, the Peace Corps does nothing for the peoples of that. That the Peace Corps shows up. It's a little, you know, cross cultural exchange for the people going, but it does open the Peace Corps' eyes, and that idea of, of fully integrating service so that service, because that then introduces people to others, um, and that whole idea of othering then is, is truly from an early stage challenge, because to me, it's the othering. It's, it's always me versus you, and that is the greatest challenge that humans have, that we are separate and encased in the shell and anything outside of us we perceive to be a threat until it isn't. So I throw that out there. 
love to hear thoughts. Thanks for throwing, never stopping. Ian, you were raising your hand, and of course I want to hear what Arno says uh, to it. But I, I assume you, who, whoever, so, so kick, who wants to? Arno, go, go ahead. It was, it was uh, directly because you, you were directly addressed and, and about, yeah, uh, the idea, what, what we can learn of, of service and the power that service has and the linkage to the educational system. So please go ahead. I really think the the power of service and the reason why it's so uh, such a healthy thing and also such a, a resounding thing with everyone who participates in it is because service is is inherently being about what you're for rather than what you're against. And I think when we orient ourselves, whether individually or as a society, by what we're opposed to, we are logically defined by that thing. We can't exist without that thing, which is why I will never call myself an anti-racist and I will never call myself an anti-fascist and why when a school says we need an anti-bullying program, I say, I don't do anti-bullying. I do pro-kindness. I do pro-compassion and I do pro-service. And that's why service is such a powerful answer to bullying, to racism, to fascism to all these social illnesses that, that plague us because service doesn't play by those rules. Service plays by its own rules of connection and uh, seeing yourself in others and asking what you can do to help rather than like rallying around a, a common enemy. Um, th that to me is, is crucial and, and that's been one of my biggest concerns uh, throughout this, the past week and a half in the United States is that, yeah, we're, I, I love it that so many people in this country are coming up and saying Black Lives Matter. I think Black Lives Matter is an incredibly positive statement. I'm 100% behind it. My little thing is I, I say, hey, if all lives matter can't be true until Black Lives Matter too. It, it, it's, a, it's a logical statement. So when people are like, all lives matter. Okay, if you really believe that, then you need to get behind the, this idea that black lives matter. But at the same time, I've seen a lot of advocates for the black lives matter concept, just kind of finding them while they're saying black lives matter, they're also saying that all cops are racist. I, cleaning up graffiti in Minneapolis, a lot of the graffiti said, slaughter all the pigs, kill all the police. I went to a march in Milwaukee that was led by a faith community of young faith leaders, and it was a, a ton of young people who were saying all coppers are bastards, all cops are racist, the cops have to go, fuck 12. Like It, it, just, it, it was as hateful as anything I've ever done. And I, I just don't believe that we can build anything good with hate. I, I don't think hate has ever uh, made society a better place, and I don't think it's ever going to be. I understand that in the lens of privilege, like, uh, yes, I, it's easy for me to say this as a straight white guy. I'll say that I learned this from people of color that I've been working with for the past 10 years, Daryl Davis being one of my greatest teachers. But, uh, and this does not say that there's not a, a place for anger. Obviously there's, when I saw the video of George Floyd being murdered by a white cop as two other white cops and an Asian cop uh, prevented bystanders from interfering, I hated that guy. I wanted to kill him with my bare hands. I, I feel that as a human being when I see one of my fellow human beings being murdered in public by people who are supposed to serve and protect us. But if I just let that emotion lead me by the nose, it's not gonna lead me anywhere good. I have to go into that emotion and sit with it and understand that the reason I'm so angry is because of my compassion and my connection with George Floyd, and that needs to guide my intentions, not the hatred. And, and I, I, I'm adamant about that, and I'm going to be very outspoken about that, and it's, it's not an easy uh, position to be in nowadays, because I'm told that if I'm not an anti-racist, I'm a racist. And, and I, I'm, I'm, you know, there's all sorts of these ultimatums going around, and that, that's, again, that's a normal human response also. When we're traumatized, we, we, the more traumatized we are, the more we orient the binary thinking. 
So we, we need to be mindful of that, but we also need to be mindful that, that hate's not going to create anything good. And, and that hating police is, uh, it, right now what's happening in the United States is there's all sorts of people going out saying the, the cops are all racist, they're all violent animals, and cops who are already on edge, who are already like, they're, they're stuck in the same cycle of violence as the, as the people that they're supposed to serve are. They're even more on edge than it never been. And so now more incidents of police brutality happen and you have this vicious cycle of self-fulfilling prophecy that, that's not going to lead anywhere good. So I, I think a, a huge duty of anyone in positions of leadership during this time is to say, to be about what you're for rather than what you're against. I think that's the answer to, to that issue. Any, any longer Jermaine or relevant? Oh. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I just, uh, I, um, it, it leads me back so, to, to one statement. Or it was a phrase that, that Daryl, you, you used um, to say, we, it's like we're seeing a turning the page of history, a moment where things start to change and we all agree that um, it will never be the same and, and a new normal will emerge from that. Um, uh, uh, and, and yeah, new, new rules. So um, I, I would like to address the question, what can we do? It's like we had it at the moment of service. Um, we, we also heard about the point how wrong it can go, how easily it is to hate or to join uh, to join people in hating each other. So what do we need to do when we are at this turning page? The page will be turned one way or the other to help creating that it will be a good page we're turning or that there will be something written on we, we like to read or like future generations to read. Um, so I would like to start with Daryl, what is your opinion? What is needed um, that this turning the page will lead to a good story? What will lead to a good story is this. You know, people have been calling for people to wake up, wake up, you know, take a look at what's going on here. I think people are already woken up, but they haven't got out of bed yet. So it's time to get out. You know, the first step is to wake up. Um, we, we, we've, we've passed that, that. I mean, how, how can you not be awake with what's going on out, out here in the streets? You know, half the country is, is burning down and people are marching. So yes, you are awake. But the second step is to get out of bed, put your feet on the floor and get moving, get moving on some action. There are a lot of things that need to be done. Um, you know, let's take a look at, at, the, at the police officer, now former police officer, who uh, I, I won't use the term murdered George Floyd. I will use the term lynched George Floyd. And let me explain that. You can go on Google, Google if you haven't seen them already. Uh, I have a ton of them in books and stuff. Pictures of, of lynchings, pictures of black men hanging from trees while a white crowd stands around smiling into the camera and pointing at the bodies. Even families, little girls, adults. This is, and, and these things were turned into postcards where they would mail the postcards to their family members outside of their town or outside of their state to say, look what we've done. This is how we address our nigger problem or whatever, all right? Those people are not the ones in the tree, the people on the ground posing for the pictures, looking into the camera and smiling. Those are lynch mobs. You know, they go grab somebody off the street or, or they're in cahoots with the law enforcement. Uh, they, they, you know, they leave the, uh, the key, the door unlocked so they can come in and grab the person out of the jail cell and take him and string him up on a tree. That is a lynch mob. When I saw what was happening to George Floyd, and, and we've seen that many times before, many times before. Uh, we saw it with Eric Garner, same thing, for selling loose cigarettes. He was choked to death on camera saying, I cannot, I, I cannot breathe. When I saw that with George Floyd, you had Two guys sitting on his legs. He's already down on the ground on his stomach, handcuffed. He wasn't moving, he wasn't resisting. And you had Derek Chauvin with his knee on, on his neck choking him. And the other officer standing there trying to hold people, you know, passers by on the sidewalk from coming too close. Looking into the camera as he's murdering somebody 
as though posing for a picture. What I saw was a lynch mob, a lynch mob made out, made out of the very people that we pay to serve and protect. It was nothing less than a lynching and, and done with blatant wanton disregard for the law, with pure impunity, because he never thought anybody would ever come after him, even if he was on camera killing someone. He had already shot and killed two people. This man had 18 complaints against him in his personnel file. Two of them involved shootings in which two people died. Now, I don't know of any other institution except for, and I, you know, I'm, I'm probably gonna catch some grief for this, uh, except for perhaps the Catholic Church. I don't know of any other institution that allows you to have that many complaints against you. When you are a police officer, you are given a license to kill. Like James Bond, you, you are given a license to kill, if necessary, to use deadly force. There was no need for deadly force with George Floyd. When you, when you drive your car, it's because you are given a license to drive your car. And if you are out there driving drunk or high on drugs and the police pull you over, they give you a ticket for what we call in this country a DWI, driving while intoxicated, or a DUI, driving under the influence. And if you get one or so, uh, you, may, you may possibly still retain your license. You'll go to court, they'll send you to some treatment rehab or whatever, um, they'll fine you, maybe put you in jail for a couple of days, and then you're back to you know, your normal routine. Um, but you get a second one or a third one, they're gonna pull your license, you're not driving anymore. If a doctor has 18 malpractice complaints, at the hospital, I, you, you can rest assured the hospital is going to get rid of that doctor because they're going to shut down that hospital. How can a man who has 19 years on the police force with 18 complaints, that's almost one complaint per year, still have a license to kill, to be a police officer after he's already killed two people? Now he's killed a third. It was not a question of if this is going to happen. It was just a question of when is it going to happen? And it happened, uh, what, two, almost two Mondays ago. Now, the things that, that need to be done, nobody, nobody was listening. Nobody has been listening to us for decades, for over a century, when we've been talking about police brutality. And even when that man had 18 complaints against him, that's 18 voices that went unheard. Because if perhaps if they had addressed just one of those 18 complaints and, and retrained that officer or reprimanded him or pulled him off street patrol or whatever, George Floyd might be alive. And all this stuff about, well, George Floyd had drugs in his system and he was a criminal and blah, blah, blah. None of that is relevant. You know, the courts decide how to punish criminals, not the police. Your job is to arrest, bring them in, and let the, and let the courts and the judge handle the rest of it. You don't, you're, you're not, you know, executor and, and arrester and all, all, all in one. Um, people need to listen. And now they're starting to listen. And the, the reference that I, you know, that I made about the Catholic priests, time and time and time again, we hear about these priests who have abused uh, little boys for over 40 years, and they're still serving. Uh, they, the place where, when they get in trouble, the place where they go is right near my house, no matter if they got in trouble in California or New York or right here in the DC area. The holding place is right here in Silver Spring near my house. 
uh, they, are, they are brought there they're, they're, and they're held there for a while by, by the Catholic Church uh, until they figure out where they're going to send them. And they send them to another uh, congregation, another parish, somewhere outside of where the abuse occurred. And sooner or later, guess what? They're abusing somebody there. And then they come back to this holding place and they get sent somewhere else. You know, nothing changes. They just keep getting moved around. Well, these police, um, when they get fired, there is no repercussion after that, unless they go to court and get put in jail or in prison for it for years. When they get fired from one force and they're still uh, able to roam around, what do they do? This is all they know. They go join another police force. And you, you, ha you have cops that, you, that, that are bad cops that, are on, that have been on multiple police forces. Did they get fired from one? They go get a job at another one because they have the experience. We need a national registry for cops who have been fired for using these kinds of um, tactics, where, you know, for any kind of um, justifiable complaint. And they get fired for that. They need, their name needs to be on a national registry. So when they apply for a job at another police department several states away, they won't get it. It's just like the, the, uh, the sex abusers national registry in this country. You abuse some kid in California and, and, and your name goes on that registry, it's visible to anybody hiring you in New York City. And they, oh, this person's a child abuser. No, no, we, we're not gonna hire this person. That's one of the things that we need for these, um, these, uh, these uh, serial um, police officers who engage in serial misconduct. Uh, and there, you know, there are a lot of other things you know, that can be done. Not one, one of the other things, and then I'll close uh, for, for, my, for my answer here, is everybody talks about uh, good cops and bad cops. I, I say no. There are three categories, and people often overlook the third category because it's the minority category. And when I say minority, I'm not talking about um, ethnicity or anything like that. I'm talking about the least popular, the, the very small uh, in numbers. We all know what bad cops do. A good cop will not do those things, but the good cop will not tell on the bad cop. In other words, he will not be a snitch because they have that blue wall of silence, that blue code of silence where you don't uh, reveal other things about your fellow officers. All right, so a good cop won't, won't participate in, in, in the misconduct, but he will not uh, you know, tell uh, the superiors on that. The third category of police, which I say are the minority, the smallest group, are the honest cops. They will not do what a bad cop does, but they will report it, they will tell. And as a result of their doing so, there is retaliation against them because their name leaks out and next thing you know, when they go on a call uh, for something and there's a shootout and they're calling for backup, other police in the area hear the, the, the call for backup. They're like, uh-uh, I'm not going to go back him up. He, he broke the code. He snitched. So they don't care if you get shot or not. Uh, one of the honest cops that a movie was made about many years ago, he's still living in New York. He was with the NYPD. His name was Frank Serpico. And the movie Serpico was all about that. He was an honest cop. And the cops shot him for, for, for being honest, all right? Um, so we need a mechanism by which police officers can, good police officers can tell on, and blow the whistle on their fellow officers without their, their identity being revealed and, and getting uh, repercussions and ramifications as a result of their telling. Just like when, uh, when a crime is committed, and the police have no clue how to solve it, they put out an announcement uh, to please call this number if you have any information. You know, you, you can call it anonymously, you get a reward. We need that same kind of anonymous kind of thing for police officers. And we need an outside body to investigate the complaints of police officers. You can't have the police investigating the police. Sure, while there are some decent, honest cops in, in internal affairs, who, who, are, who are out to nail the bad cops. There are plenty 
who have risen to that level who will not uh, prosecute uh, the, uh, the, the, the bad cops below them. You know why? Because 20 years, when they, were, when they were out, 20 years prior, when they were down on the streets patrolling, they were doing the same thing. They were, they were using excessive force, kicking bribes. So what, what, why are they going to condemn so, some other officer who was doing exactly what they did 20 years prior? So we need an outside source to look at, at these cases. And I think that will help and go a long ways. I fully agree with you, Daryl, about the, the nature of uh, policing. I, I agree with the three uh, categories of cops entirely. I also agree that there needs to be an independent outside entity uh, looking, overlooking and, and administering uh, complaints of pr police brutality and that letting the cops investigate themselves is plainly not working. Uh, well, one thing I think is, is overlooked over and over and over again, and it's overlooked because of people's political attachments, is the just as the Vatican was the entity that shuffles around these priests after they've raped children to other places where they can be shielded from accountability, the police union is the, the entity that shuffles around bad cops and shields them from accountability for their actions. If we look back, look at George Floyd, uh, look at Eric Garner, you can go down the list tragically of name after name after name after name of unarmed black people who were murdered by police. The number one reason why the cops are not held to accountability is because the police union protects them. I'm all for organized labor. I think organized labor is an important part of our economic structure. But when organized labor of any type is more oriented to exonerating their labor union members, no matter what, rather than uh, focused on the excellence of their labor union members, organized labor becomes a part of the problem rather than the solution. And the police union is a perfect example of that. If the police union spent half as much energy focusing on the excellence of a, being a police officer, which means you don't use excessive force, you don't abuse your license to kill. If they spent energy on that rather than exonerating the, these cops that are plainly wrong, that would have a huge effect to reduce police brutality. And, and I, I think that needs to be front and center going forward and I, I think it's a very interesting moment we're facing as a society because the, the police union now in uh, Minneapolis and, and in a broader sense, it, it, they understand that this, they're under scrutiny like they've never been under before. But we, we have to keep that scrutiny on that particular organization and not just like on cops as a general thing, not as – and this is an instance where – while I agree there's systemic racism, it can also become a red herring if we're all like systemic racism, systemic racism without looking at the police union. And, and the fact is, is that left-leaning political people, pol progressive people, the, the majority of people who are out here sh shouting Black Lives Matter are just like abhorrent to point their finger at a labor union and say, hey, there's a problem here. So it, it's, we, we need to have honest conversations with ourselves and with our society and get outside of our political attachments and realize that, that the solution isn't within a, a dogmatic political approach, but within a, a thoughtful, open-minded approach so we can see all the elements that are creating these problems. I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you 100% on that, on the police union thing. I've, I've gone back and forth with uh, presidents of, uh, of the local FOP and, and, uh, and various police unions. And another thing that, that, uh, that is, uh, is false, when the police chief comes on uh, the, the, uh, the TV or the newspaper or wherever, or the, or the police public relations officer comes out and makes an announcement, you know, first thing that happens is when a police officer does something and, and it's questionable or whatever, they, they will say uh, he followed proper police procedure. And, and in the rare case, you know, because, and, he, and, and they always say, you know, I feared for my life. That's their catchphrase that, that gives them justification for killing someone. Uh, in some cases, it, it, it's true. But when they use it all the time, it's like the boy that cried wolf. Um, and but then in the rare cases, 
where a police officer is convicted in court, then the, pub, the uh, public information officer or the chief changes the story. Instead of saying, you know, he followed a proper police procedure, it was a justifiable homicide, et cetera, a justifiable shooting. Um, then they say, well, you know, in a, in, a, in a department this size, you know, you're bound to have a few bad apples. I've heard that so many times over the last 35 years that I've been doing this kind of work. Uh, that is a lie. And any police chief or, or public relations officer, public information officer says that, I'm calling that person a liar, flat out, because there are more bad apples in the police department than there are good ones. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you how, I, how I come to that conclusion. Because if you have that many good police officers and you only have a few bad apples, wouldn't all the good ones get rid of the bad ones when they go to the union, go to the police chief and say, hey, listen, I joined this force to do what was right. I don't want to let some crazy guy tarnish my badge who's supposed to be my brother or sister on this force. If you're, if you're playing football or basketball, or you and I are no, we're in bands together, not, no, not together, but we were in bands. Um, but if, if, if one of your musicians is not playing what he's supposed to be playing that makes you look good, you fire him and you bring in another guitar player or whatever. If you're, if you're on the basketball court and one of your teammates is not being team friendly and, and doing something else, you bench him and bring in somebody else. You know, we don't, we don't drive around with 18 DWIs and still have our license. Daryl, you know, you, it's, I'm, yes, Rebecca. Yeah, yeah. Do you, I, I, I was going to, I, I want to be sort of provocative and, and absolutely. Let's, let's roll. Yeah, I know. Right on. I, I know you can do it. Um, I, I disagree with you. Um, okay. And I, I'll tell you why. And uh, just really briefly, the reason that I'm doing this work, other than, you know, it's been a calling my whole life, is that when I used to work in psychiatric hospitals, I witnessed people literally torture um, in, in sort of the guise of managing these chaotic, uh, disturbed patients, uh, do things that we would never do towards another human being. And, and it was, you know, people of, of mixed races. And I mean, in other words, the, they weren't, of, the individual wasn't, there were multiple different races. And the way people behaved towards incarcerated, insane people was dehumanizing. And so it, then I began to look at the work of Zimbardo, who um, has looked into kind of the nature of evil, but he's also the one that was looking at the torture that was happening in Abu uh, Ghraib, I think is how you pronounce yes. it. And so, and then I also, by the way, used to work with perpetrating priests about 30 years ago at the institution that's in, in the DC area. It used to be in right. Southern Maryland. Near my house. Yeah, and I, I worked for a year. It was only a year, but I really saw the Catholic system basically um, uh, hold its own in order to protect this larger system. And people used to say to me all the time, well, do you think that priests in, or, or people that are struggling with their sexuality go into the priesthood. That's not the case. They're not going there to repress their sexuality. They're going there because they have a calling. And I would say to you that police officers initially go into the work because they have a calling, but the system is, it perpetrates and group think. And that's what I think is the most dangerous thing is that you could say that it's police officers. And there is something about, you give somebody a baton or you give them, a, excuse me, a baton, or you give them a gun and they do behave differently. And then you put them in a group where they've basically got the lives of others and all human beings begin to behave badly, sadly. Um, so, so my thought is, yeah, I, I agree with you hit that system, the policing system, because it, it's, it, it's um, you know, the, like what they're learning about the fraternal order of police and, and these unions that, that, that basically um, perpetuate 
their capacity to continue to not police itself, so to speak. But, but the danger of people turning into police, and you can even see it with this sort of violence begets violence, where uh, people do things that they would not otherwise do if, if they are either in, in a system that naturally dehumanizes the people with whom they're encountering. So the police are trained to dehumanize and detach from their subjects, or same thing with mental health workers. And, and then, um, and I, I think Marcus has done a lot of work around this, how we are all capable of doing this kind of evil if we're in the right situation. And I think that sadly, that's the most frightening thing is that, that we, have to, we have to be sure that we do not succumb to that. Um, even, even the protesters, that they don't succumb to it, um, to, to that impulse. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Okay, let me, let me, let me give you some pushback. Pushback. Okay, okay. I, I, you, you ready to roll. All right, so uh, I agree with what you're saying um, that, you know, some people get into that groupthink mentality, but that is not always the case, all right? Because I, you know, I've gone to school high school uh, with people who would become cops. And I can tell you something, when a bullies in my school became cops, guess what? There were bullies on the police force. When the goody two shoes, as we call them, every, you know, every, do everything right by the book, never got in trouble, et cetera, you know, they're goody two shoes. Um, when they became cops, they're still goody two shoes. So, you know, they, they do the right thing. They're the honest cops. And I, and I know them personally because I went to high school with them. And I know this, this kid was a, was a jackass in high school. And he was always beating up on people. And now he's a cop. Oh, my God. He's out there doing the same crap. You know, now he has a license to do it. Before, he was always in the principal's office. Now he's got a license to do it. Um, so, yes, there are people who fall into group, in, in, you know, their followers, psychophants or whatever you want to call them, who fall into that group, group think. But then there are people who are individuals who, who just have it in their nature to, uh, to be that way. Um, I, and, and as far as, as the protesters go, let, let me explain something that I, I don't think a lot of people understand. And let me be clear that I'm not advocating and I'm not justifying the destruction of property and burning down buildings and all that. The looting, absolutely not, okay? That, that is just f flat out wrong and, and destroying some little mom and pop store, you know, that is just flat out wrong. Um, again, I, I'm not advocating you go, you go to corporations and burn them down either exactly, but I understand why it is happening. And let me, un, let me explain it to you uh, so, so you'll have perhaps understand, because people are always asking me because I'm black. Well, Daryl, why, why do black people go and, and start burning down everything, even in their own neighborhoods? Why are they burning down these places? Let me tell you why they're doing that. They have been asking not to be treated specially, but to be treated equally for over 100 years. And they have not received that. They've been shut down. You know, we don't want to hear it. We're not going to hear it. We're not going to listen to it. All right? And nothing changes. When you are driving and you run through a red light or you, or, or you are speeding and the cop pulls you over, what does he do? He gives you a citation, a ticket. If, if you do something to somebody and they take you to court, they sue you. Uh, if, you if you committed a crime, the judge imposes a fine upon you. If you don't pay your credit card bill on time, you get a late penalty. All these instances I just, I just gave you examples of cost you money. Nobody wants to be charged money. Nobody wants to separate themselves from their money. And so when people impose a fine of money upon you, it's meant to curb your behavior to, to, so that you won't speed again and you won't run that red light again if you have to pay $150 for doing it. Or if you did something to somebody and they sued you and won $50,000, you're not going to do that again, all right? If you got a fine on, 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 your, on your credit card bill because you paid it because it's a late and you get a charge, you're going to pay it on time the next time. All right. 
So money talks. Money is able to make somebody change their behavior. So when these people go out and they burn down these buildings, yes, a lot of it is, is out of anger and out of frustration. And of course, there are always going to be anarchists who come in and do it for the joy and just to instigate stuff. But the people who are, who are serious about their cause and they participate in this kind of thing, it is their way of writing a speeding ticket or imposing a fine upon the city because it's gonna cost the city money, millions of dollars to rebuild for not listening. And now all of a sudden when the, when, when the country is, is burning to the ground now, uh, they're starting to listen. So fire do, does make changes. Again, I'm, I'm not saying I advocate the burning down of buildings and all that and destruction, but it does have a way of, of getting somebody's attention because it hits them in the wallet and it curbs that behavior. I will, thank you. I would like to, I'm, I think if, if I'm right, just, I mean, I think Daryl, you will have to leave in, in some minutes. Yes, I, I do. So we start running out of time, but I, I, I want to definitely hear Ian's thoughts and then I would like to do a, a closing round um, to do that. Just one thing for me, because exactly, um, I was thinking, I, I think that, that Rebecca and Daryl, that your thoughts are not so, uh, so, so... No, they're not, they're not a part of that, that um, far. No, no. But, but because I was thinking of Zimbardo um, uh, the time before, and uh, you already mentioned him, and Zimbardo says that you have always have the metaphor that you have a barrel with apples and you have one bad apple inside starting to turn the other apples bad. And Zimbardo calls that the fundamental attribution error because he said it's the, cons the way the barrel is constructed that starts uh, turning the apples bad and at the beginning all apples are bad. Uh, all, all apples are good at the beginning and through the construction, the system, the, the way the system uh, works, they are turned bad. And my thought was, and this is what, what I will want, want to give to you, Ian, um, is that schools and police forces are maybe two systems that are, have many similarities. Like they have strict rules how the day works, they, they have a clear hierarchy in the system. And I think maybe that people that are good and bad in the one start being good and bad in the other one can be influenced by a system that offers these roles as solutions and they take the role the system offers to them. Um, and maybe if It, it, it is really, it goes back to the point how you can build systems um, that probably just don't offer the, the possibility or the role of being, you know, a, a bully uh, at, at, at both sides. So maybe this could be possible. But um, I know, Ian, you, you're a teacher and you're working with teachers and I want to hear your thoughts on, on this, the system, the schools and what, what we just discussed. I don't, I mean, it's difficult. I don't really think I have a, I have an inform, a sufficiently informed opinion to comment on um, the situation in the US, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, um, the police. You know, it's, it's something I only encounter through secondhand, through media, or thirdhand, through hearing people talk about it. So there's no way I'm going to pitch it. I do want to respond to the point you made about schools. I, I think it's important to remember that schools do have rules. Um, but societies have rules. Uh, a school is much more like a society than it is like a police force, I suspect, or a police service. I think, I think one of the things I would say is that for an awful lot of young people, adolescents really appreciate boundaries. When you're an adolescent, you need to know where the boundary is. Yeah, you're going to test it all the time, you know, but you need to know it's there because the boundary makes you feel safe. And I think one of the things that we see at the moment, actually, as, as kind of Many people kind of go, whoopee, school is now happening online. Well, some things are happening online, but it's not school because school is somewhere that keeps, that strives to keep young people safe. And one of the things it does to do that is give them clear boundaries. And if adolescents have clear boundaries, they really like that. They really appreciate it. They don't, they don't always kind of respond really well to it, but it is an important thing. And they will always test it because that's part of being an adolescent. You know, but at the same time, I know that having trained teachers, you know, you don't want to be the teacher who doesn't have any boundaries because <laughs> you're not going to have a good time. 
and actually young people will get a lot more out of the teacher who has clear boundaries, who is strict, who is possibly scary. You know? but, but that means that you know where you stand in that classroom. Yeah? And it's always important that you know where you stand. And I think one of the challenges of leaving school and finding your way as an adult is that the, the boundaries in society are not always as clear and not always as fair uh, and not always um, a, a, as apparent. So, I mean, I have no comment whatsoever on, on the state of American policing. I, all I know is what I see in the media and, and, and what's presented to me. I'm not, I don't have any personal experience, so I can't really comment. But in terms of schools, I think boundaries are, boundaries and rules are really important for young people in schools. And they, they do react to them differently, but I think it's important to see them as something very positive uh, that, that help frame something that is, that is very important for young people. And I think that social and emotional learning, which is one of the things that for an awful lot of people is not happening virtually. Um, and I think that's a real shame because schools do so much that isn't delivering curriculum. <laughs> right? Delivering curriculum is one of the least important things that schools do. You know, I, I exaggerate. It is, it is significant. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the thing that makes you a good person is not whether you learn all these dates, but how you learn to, to get on with other people, how you learn to express yourself, how you learn to be a whole person. And, and I think that's, that's the thing that, in a way, many education systems are really suffering at the moment because they're not finding a way to deliver that. Thank you so much, Ian. I, I think it, is, I, it, it is, in fact, I think, a, a very important answer to the topic we are discussing here. Um, so I really hate to, to interrupt this, this discussion, but time is running out and I think we, we could go on forever. <laughs> and it, it would be a great discussion. We should we definitely have to do this again. But I want to um, yeah, close with a, a short closing session. So I would... Uh, again, encourage you to do a short statement. And we heard a lot of that uh, the so society is changing. And I would say, what would be your advice for people when they want to, to get out of bed? Um, how should they prepare for the upcoming crisis or the crisis to continue? So what would the advice you give to the future generations now rising? What should they look for during the crisis? Um, Anna, would you like to open the round? Actually, uh, let's start with Daryl because I know he's in a time crunch and then uh, maybe he can cut out when he's done. Okay, great. I would say prepare, preparation. Think about what you want achieved before you go to bed. So already have that, that mindset before you go to sleep. And then when you wake up in the morning and you get out of bed, You're, you're not wondering, what am I going to do today? So you've already prepared yourself and get out there and create an action. Uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Our, our country or our society can only become one of two things. It can become that which we sit back and let it become, or, we, or number two, it can become that which we stand up and make it. So ask yourself the question before you go to bed so you can sleep on it. Do I want to sit back and see what my country becomes? Or do I want to stand up and make my country become what I want to see? And when you make your decision, then you'll know what to do when you get out of bed. To me, this conversation emphasized once again the, the importance of compassion in our human experience, whether it's on an individual level or a societal level. Suffering demands witness. We are going to bear witness to suffering one way or another. There is no choice about that. The choice is, do we bear witness to suffering through compassion or do we bear witness to suffering through aggression? And what's happening in the United States right now, everything that Daryl talked about is because there has not been com compassion for the African American community for well over for centuries. And that lack of compassion is resulting in us bearing witness to, to the suffering and aggression. So it's, we need to study compassion, practice compassion, make it a daily part of our lives, make it a part of our society. That's the, the answer. And, and that's my uh, take on, on Daryl's challenge to, to what, how, what am I going to make society do? And my, my second thought in closing 
was uh, just catalyzed by Ian, which I'm so grateful for. It's so important nowadays. When Ian was asked about the state of policing in the United States of America, he said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have firsthand knowledge of this. All I know is what I'm told by the media, what I'm told by content that comes at me. And, and if everybody said that, we would be in so much better position to, to address all of these problems. So I, 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 while we're being compassionate, let's be driven by our firsthand experience and things that we've, we've learned firsthand from listening to people in person from experiencing things firsthand, uh, not to completely cut ourselves off from the daily news, but understand that everything we get that we don't see and hear and feel uh, in person is, is going through one filter or another, and it's influenced by one sort of agenda or another. And, and that means that we, we need to take it in, but take it with a, a fistful of salt and, and not have our worldview shaped by second, third, fourth hand information, but first hand information. And thank you guys all so much for this conversation. It's been fantastic. Thank you, Arnold. Thank you, Arnold. So Rebecca, you want to continue? I was also, uh, Arno. I totally picked up on what you're talking about with Ian, that Ian just said, I don't know. And I was like, oh, what a great, you know, just, we don't all, we're so, used to experting in some ways and certainly we have opinions but to just say i'm you know pausing and taking in information and you know i would say that um i you know i wish daryl was still here because yeah we could go on with this conversation for a long time but it's so nice to be in dialogue and again these words like i think of words that are so critical like dialogue service um compassion and what my interest in is how to get those into action how do you actually get people to experience that i would say service is one of them and also to realize that we are all vulnerable to this we are all um you know i i have evil in me and i can act on it at any moment i have hate in me and um, if I don't, and I believe in psychology and understanding human nature as a way to, to intervene with that. Um, and, and the last thing that I would say is, is just that we, we need to, like service, I believe is the way to do this, but we must familiarize and reach out to people that are other than that, because otherwise we are in a bubble. And so an action is to simply, you know, that thing which you think is not you, find out more about it. That thing which you think is you, find out more about it. Is it really that much you? Because the more alike we think we are, the less we are. And the more different we think we are, the less different we are. And so that the action is to extend ourselves. I think the method would be service. That's my belief that if we just put service like 70% what of, of education, policing, all of this, if it was simply to do service, but, but that's a, a more complex matter. So thank you so much. You're an amazing group of people. Marcus, let's hear from you. Close us out. Okay, I, I, I would have heard Ian first, but <laughs> I, I, I can continue and, and I, 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 I say my thoughts and then I continue with Ian and then ah. I, I say some, some closing words. Um, but, but yeah, if, if you ask me, so I am, um, my, my advice or, or what, I, what I learned from is really, yeah, to this point to really, some kind of what, what Daryl said to the people, think of what is important of, to you, think what you want this society to become and do not just be a bystander because we, we talked a lot about about the bystanders and i think if you start to you know reject the role of being a bystander and take your own role to what you want to do you are already changing the system and you can you, you should think before to what to what kind of system you want to to change it um this is the one thing and the second thing is uh, i i would like to give the advice to 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 people to um yeah 
join others, reach out for others, help them, serve them, and but also reach out for people that know things you do not know, that challenge your thoughts. Um, this is all, all of, of, of this discussion, and I think it's absolutely the, the same, and, and Daryl knows that. To all of you, uh, including Daryl, thank you so much for this amazing discussion and, uh, and, and for all the thoughts. It is, it is really a, a privilege and an honor to, to find myself on this group. Um, and I think this is because it, I think we also talked about resilience to reaching out to people and, you know, yeah, joining, joining people, bonding with people is something that gives you and them resilience. And you can reach out to especially the people um, you do not like to try to give them resilience and try to, what, what this can do to change the system to maybe things we do not know yet. So thank you. Ian, you would like, I would like to hear your clothing thoughts. Okay, I think, I think for me, again, it, it, as, as, to echo what everyone said, it's been a pleasure and an honor to sit here and listen to you. I think particularly listening to Daryl talking about his perspective of, of some of the stuff that's been happening in the US lately and Arno talking about his experience of, of kind of working on the cleanup after some of the stuff that's been going on. It's a real a privilege to hear that. I do think the one thing I want to kind of pick out is, is Arno's thing about don't identify yourself by the thing that you're not. I think that's a really good, you know, if you're an anti-fascist and you, once you've defeated fascism, then where are you? If you're only defining yourself by the thing that you oppose, then, then that's a waste of time. I, I, th I think that's a, a really critical thing. And that I think ties into something that Marcus was saying about, you know, getting together with other people, finding things out, but also don't be afraid to lead. You might be the person who has the vision or the experience or the idea that can transform it. And I think, I think one thing I would say from my experience of, of being a teacher and working with young people is that, um, you know, they, some of the most amazing leaders I've ever, I've ever come across, <laughs> I'm 14 years old, there are already people who have a total vision of what they want the world to be. So they're going to make it happen. And, and that is amazing. And we should all be like that. If we see something we know to be unjust, we should do something about it. If we see something that we, if there's a change we want to do, we should be as enthusiastic and as, as committed as some of those young people. And I think it's one of the things that gives me great, great hope i mean rebecca you said earlier on i'm a kind of teetering on a balance between being optimistic and pessimistic i am but I, I think one of the things that gives me real optimism is when you meet young people who are genuinely committed to transformation and i think one of the most wonderful things that i've seen in, in connection with the recent black lives matter staff is the way that young people are taking a lead in it and it's not just the usual suspects there's young people from all kinds of communities, all kinds of backgrounds who are saying, no, enough's enough, I want to change this. And who have a vision for a better, more just, fairer, inclusive, genuinely inclusive society. All the things that the rhetoric for hundreds of years has said, this is what society should be like, and then no one ever kind of really did anything about it. Well, maybe, maybe their leadership will be the thing that transforms it for the future. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, then once again, thank, thank you so much to everyone uh, here, also to Daryl. I would also like to thank you to everybody who is watching this, whatever, and, and want to, to encourage, in, encourage everybody watching to get into conversation with other people, get into conversation with people you perhaps don't know or disagree with, um, because I think with we, we, we experience definitely here how much conversation can, can help and, and what it can bring us, especially dialogue to, um, yeah, to, to build up or learn more about what we really want to do and, and how we want to create this society. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Okay. I'll